Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and Life Coach Cindy Shavaz here. It is Tuesday, December the 19th, 2017. Just six more days till Christmas. 8 a.m. Eastern Time, and we're here for another day of your daily dose of happy here on LOA Today. And Cindy, glad to have you back here. Hope you've been having a good uh, past weekend and, and uh, uh, a week since the last time we talked, which I believe was last Wednesday. Yeah, thanks for having me back. I, I'm happy to be here and have had a great busy week, but I think, like I said to you earlier, I'm sliding into home plate now, so... I love Winding that analogy. down and ready for the holidays. Sliding into home plate in, in football season. I mean, there are football yep. fans who are going into a dead faint right now, but baseball is my favorite <laughs> sport, so I love that. That's great. <laughs> and I have to admit, I was really surprised before the podcast. You told me that you're a, a Yankee fan, and I'm a Yankee fan, and it's one of those things you either love the Yankees or you hate them. There's no in-between, so I was glad to hear you like them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I have two sons, and when they were growing up, I uh, I was the scorekeeper and coached part of the time, so baseball was a lot um, more in my life than football. Ah. And they didn't ever play football, so of really? course they're football fans. But um, I've always been a bigger baseball fan than a football fan. But well, you know, sports are good, and uh, <laughs> well, especially given all the issues about uh, concussions and so forth, it's probably a good thing they stayed away from football. So that, that's good. Yes, it's one of the reasons why I was glad they stayed away from football. It just always seemed so dangerous, especially they were not on the uh, on the side of the spectrum of these huge people. And, boy, I mean, one of the coaches was trying to get me to have one of my sons kept nudging me, come on, come on, get him on the football team. And I was like, look at him. <laughs> some of the other kids were like twice as big as he was. I was like, no. So baseball was always a little easier, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's actually the hardest thing in sports is to hit a baseball. So it, it, there's plenty of challenge there, but it's it's much less likely that you're going to get creamed by a, a linebacker coming off of a blitz. I mean, it's just not as likely. Yeah, because that's part of it, right? In football, you're always going to. I mean, you you plan for that. So yes, I don't want to play a sport where I'm going to plan to get run over, but. <laughs> Which is a good thing. So, so anyway, we're, we're, um, we were kind of, uh, spinning our wheels a little bit trying to come up with a topic this morning. And we realized a good one is just the three step manifestation process because we were realizing that a lot of people, including myself and many times, I get stuck on step one. I get stuck on asking. I keep asking over and over and over again. And it's a three step process. You actually have to do all three steps. And, and as it turns out, in some ways, the second and third steps are the hardest ones. So I guess it's not a surprise that we spend all our time on the first one. But but uh, we, we figured that was a good topic for today. So asking, why is it, do you think, that we are constantly asking and we never get to the next two steps? Well, I think that, first of all, it's nature's, you know, way to expand, right? I mean, anybody who's ever grown a garden recognizes that especially if the mint plant starts to you know. <laughs> right, So nature wants to grow, wants to expand, and I think that's why we want things. We want to create things. We want to have things. We want to be things, do things. It's like that's just part of our nature. So the asking part is sort of, well, not sort of. I think we we ask automatically whether we know it or not. I mean, we can go back to the very basic things that we need and think of, being hungry for something to eat. I mean, our body lets us know that we need something. And so we're, we're always asking. I think that consciously asking for things is kind of a, a next step up. But we ask automatically, and that's what <laughs> I know before the show I said to you, well, maybe that's why we get that first step right. It's because we can <laughs> do it automatically. We're on autopilot with it, asking, asking. Yeah, true. Yeah, very true. And, and the fact that it is something that comes so naturally, like you say, we we ask subconsciously and unconsciously, and, and we don't realize that what we're doing is asking. Um, and, and this is really kind of a key step, a kind of a key point to understand, I guess, is maybe a better way of saying it. Every thought that we have is a request. It's a request for matching vibration, for something that, that matches what we're thinking about. And mm. while we don't necessarily 
uh, in our culture, we haven't grown up necessarily thinking that that is the nature of things. It really is the nature of things. Um, mm-hmm. and, and a number of famous people over the years have pointed out that, you know, the fact is what you are thinking about tends to be what you attract. Um, I think it was Wendy or David, I can't remember one of them, was, was pointing out that Lucille Ball, in an interview from like the 1960s, was talking about how you, you want to be really careful about what you think about because you're likely going to attract something into your life that's you know very similarly related to it. So she was totally onto how the law of attraction works, which is evident by her completely successful career. Mm-hmm. I've often heard that saying about, you know, I can't remember the number, but is it that we have 60,000 thoughts a day or 200,000 or it's a huge number? And But that if we were aware of how powerful our thoughts were, <laughs> yeah. We would we would mind them a lot better. Um same with words. You know, our words are really powerful. If we were aware of how powerful our words were, we would take a lot more care in speaking them. So Particularly because there's thought asking, and there's emotion behind them. Yeah, definitely. There's energy behind them. Once a thought has made its way into becoming a word, it's starting to gather momentum. Mhm. Yeah, that's so true. The more powerful energy, and so asking consciously, you know, as a as a coach, it's something that I'm reminding people often is that you can't have what you want if you don't know what it is. And that might sound silly, but so many times, and every coach will tell you this, that we ask a client, "What do you want?" and they often say, "I don't know." Um, and I've been in that place where I wasn't sure what I wanted. That's why it's important to get into the work of clarifying what we want because we know that the strongest clearest energy is the energy that prevails so we have to get clear about it and often getting clear about what we don't want is the first step right people usually can always answer that question and sometimes when you ask someone what they want they'll answer with what they don't want even in the (laughs) simplest line of questioning right it's like what do you want for dinner tonight oh i don't know i don't want pizza Yeah. Right. It's like right, it's so easy to say. Yeah, I don't want. I don't want this thing to happen. Um, but what do you want? Hmm. That's a harder question. So that asking consciously, um, really getting clear about what it is that we want. That's that step is important because think of going into a restaurant and the waitress or the server asks you, "What would you like?" and you say, "Oh, I don't know." <laughs> <laughs> I They're going to say, well, I'll come back in a minute, or but, I'm just going to stand here until you can tell me what it is that you want. Believe it or not, that's my normal experience in a restaurant. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> See, I'm the person that once I have something in a restaurant and I really like it, I just go in and say, oh, I don't need a menu, and I order the same thing. It's like oh, I can order God, the same yes. thing over and over, and then one day I'll get sick of it and say, okay, let me see a menu. I, I need to change out here. But well, Louise usually I suggests like the restaurant based the on what she's already thing, figured yeah. out. I mean, she she won't even suggest the restaurant until she knows what she wants to have to eat there before we even go before <laughs> we look at the, the menu. That's the way she bases you know picking a restaurant. So yeah, that's very familiar to me. <laughs> See, so she's she's on the ball there with getting really clear about what she wants, and so. Oh yeah, that's, and, that's by, important. By the way, the other thing you mentioned about how we don't really think about the fact that we don't really ask for what we want, we tend to ask for what we don't want, is I think it's epidemic. I'm, I, I think it's far beyond what life coaches run into. And just a couple of examples that come to my mind. Go to any high school graduation. And at the end of the graduation ceremony, talk to as many of the graduates as you can, and you'll find that the majority of them have no idea what they want to do with their lives. Yes. It, it's an astonishing phenomenon, and it occurs everywhere, certainly around the country, and I suspect around the world. People have no idea what they want to do coming out of school, which is partly an indictment of the school system, but it's also the fact that we just don't pay a lot of attention to what we want. However, like you said, if you tell them uh, something like, well, can you tell me what it is that you don't want to do or what it is that you don't like, they've got a long list. <laughs> so- yeah, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, the the energy levels, the one of the most prevalent or the most prevalent energy level in the world is the energy of conflict. And it's, you know, we want to all, we want to be careful not to put it in the bad category because it's the same energy level of competition. So there's a polarity. I mean, it, 
it has a range. It's not always bad. It's, you know, energy isn't good or bad. It's just energy. And so that level of, but you think about the level of conflict or competition kind of built into that level is pushing away or resistance or, you know, being unhappy with something a little more than being happy with something. So it's knowing what we don't want a little easier than knowing what we do want. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's true. I, I think there's a lot of reasons why kids graduating from high school uh, don't know what they want yet, and that definitely plays into it. Uh, I also think that it has a lot to do with just maturity, but going back to what you said, and we won't stay there, but the, the schools, you know, we, we don't make a big effort, or we haven't in the past. I think we're moving into the place where we do more and more, but we don't often focus on what the child is really loving. <laughs> boy, <laughs> oh boy, is that important. true. Oh, you know, I completely uh, agree. Because people that say, my kid can't focus, but that same kid knows every single fact you could possibly know about some topic that they love. Right. And exactly. so, you know, I'm like, well, maybe it's because we're not allowing them always to focus on the things that they love the most. I'm not, you know, I, I'm a big, I'm a, a big believer in tapping into those gifts and talents really early and then letting them develop. And so I think that may be part of it is we don't always put the focus there. Oh, I agree. I agree completely. In fact, my wife and I um, helped to found an alternative school whose uh, primary modality was the kids basically choose how they're going to spend their day. And so they end up doing exactly what their their biggest interest levels are. And, and the results are astonishing when they get a chance to do that. Um, probably the most tangible result that you see is that when they are done with school, when they graduate from school, overwhelmingly they know exactly what they want to do with their lives next. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I, it's totally possible if we put the focus there. And, you know, that that can apply to every area of our life. It's like what are we putting our focus on. And what's interesting is you were talking about three steps. Um, And it was so funny when you said, you know, we could talk about three steps. The first step, and I said, the first step being ask. And you said, yes. And in my head, I was like, well, there's only two because the second step is allow. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the the second step is actually believe. You have to believe it. Believe and receive. Ask, believe and receive. Right. But when you said it, I had to tap my brain a little bit. Like, wait, what is this? What's what's the third one? (laughs) You you ask for it and then you allow it in. You just ask for it and allow it in. See, that wasn't a problem for me. It's not a problem for me at all because belief was a really tough one for me. So it's right in the forefront of my mind. (laughs) I never forget that one. (laughs) Well, I remember talking to someone a week or so ago and... I think you said that that Wendy had gotten an email with someone that said, "Why can't I?" Right. Um, I'm asking for a certain thing, and but why isn't it coming? Um, and I get those emails too all the time. I have people say, and and these are people that are they're knowledgeable about law of attraction. Mm-hmm. They're not coming from a perspective where they have no idea that they're creating their own reality. They're coming from a perspective of, I'm trying to do this. I realize, you know, I think I can. I believe I can because people are telling me I can create what I want, and I'm trying, and I'm asking, but nothing's happening. What is going on? And I like to use the um, the object lesson of a garden because planting the seeds is like the asking part. And... Then there's the part where the seeds are under the ground. And, you know, we can walk by that little garden, and every day we walk by. You know, we come out our door on our way to where we're going, and we walk by the little patch of dirt, and it's just a little patch of dirt, and it's just dirt, and it's just the same old dirt every day. And we keep watering it, and we keep making sure that it's getting some sun. And one day we walk out, and there are sprouts. And most people give up because they're tired of walking by the dirt and seeing nothing happening. Mm -hmm. And because they think there's nothing happening. But underneath the soil, there's all kinds of things happening. And that's the thing we have to remember in that belief part is that there are things happening. It's our job to keep watering and keep the sunlight, which, you know, is a reflection of our thought process 
how are we watering those things, those seeds we've planted? What are we doing to keep that vibration up? What are we doing to focus on what it is that we want, to imagine it happening, to, as, you know, Neville Goddard used to say, which I love so much, to assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled. What are we doing to do that? How are we bringing ourselves back into alignment during that time where, you know, metaphorically we're just walking by that patch of dirt and it's just <laughs> the same old dirt? <laughs> it's like, all I see is the same old dirt. When is that thing I want going to happen? He's and that, believing. And not so much metaphorically in a sense that so many of the things that we – we, we experience and do that activity with tend to stick with us. They stick in our subconscious mind. So activity A, we, we, we reach out, we want something to have, to, to, we want something to happen and it doesn't happen quickly. So we put it into the little box that says this one didn't work. And then we go on to number B, to letter B and we try B and that one doesn't work as quickly as we want. So we put that into the same box. Oh, so that doesn't work either. And you keep doing that over and over and over again. Eventually, you get to the point where you say, well, this doesn't work, and you start believing it doesn't work. So the moment somebody says, well, you gotta, you got to believe, you, your immediate reaction is, why? Believing doesn't work. <laughs> right, and it's, it's sort of like, you know, you've, I've heard people say before, you can't keep digging the seeds back up. Yeah, right. <laughs> right, so it's sort of like, well, I'm going to go dig them up and see if they're starting to sprout, and they're not, so I planted some new ones. That's your, you know, A and B, right? It's like... This is just not working. Um, <laughs> Time for some different plans. <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes we lack patience, and we also, that goes back to the focus thing. We talk about what we focus on expands, but we have to train ourselves to focus. It takes some practice. It Is takes the- practice like the way meditation takes practice. It's a practice. We have to keep bringing our thoughts back into alignment. When we, when we notice they are wandering somewhere out there where they're not doing any good for these seeds to sprout, we have to bring those thoughts back and pay attention to what we're thinking. Because Just we, like in the beginning. We if need we're consistency. Going to, if we're going to pay attention to what we want in a way that we get really clear, and really conscious about, yes, I've decided this is what I want, um, then we have to hold on to that as we move forward in the into step two, into the belief part, and have as much focus and as much determination uh, there. And by focus, you mean consistent focus. In other words, staying consistently with the thought and feeling of whatever it is that you're you're focusing on and not spending any time at all on the contrary or on something that contradicts it. Yeah, well, I think it's important to be easy about the whole thing because when we when we get when that focus gets so hyper focused that it starts to become an attachment that's not going to work out well no uh, because that's just creating resistance but what i mean is when we catch ourselves i mean the answer to your question consistency is yes when we catch ourselves worrying when we catch ourselves not believing, you know, thinking, like you said, thinking this doesn't work. Um, when we catch ourselves creating those thoughts, that's when we need to bring ourselves back to, wait a minute, yes. And finding evidence, you know, finding evidence that it's worked before, maybe worked for someone else. Finding evidence that we have created things before consciously, uh, just that Anything we can do, lots and lots of tools to keep us in the space where we can believe for it. In fact, we also have to believe that the evidence is there. We have to be willing to accept the possibility that it's out there and can be found rather than rejecting, oh, well, there is no evidence. You know, I, I, I've just had too much experience. There, there is no evidence. So I, there's no point in looking for it. You know, that, that, that's going to be very self-defeating on the face of it. And yet, how often do we do that? How many people... Just give up on looking for evidence because they're convinced there's not going to be any evidence before they've even looked. Right, and that's the important thing about asking um, ourselves those powerful questions, right? It's like where, you know, any any kind of open-ended question that we ask ourselves, we are tapping into the part of our brain that 
solves problems, the part of our brain that is creative. So just the question, where would I look if I wanted to find evidence? That starts the process of our brain playing along with us, <laughs> right? Because that's the, that's the issue. It's like if, our, if our thought process automatically is always going to, this doesn't work, then, then we start trying to prove that theory. Then we get into the, well, I can tell you, you know, arguing for our limitations. I can tell you how many times I've tried. It's never worked. It's like, <laughs> oh, now I'm on the track of trying to convince myself that it's never going to work. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. So the question, you know, where would I look? If I knew, if I knew that this actually was going to work, where would I look for the evidence? that opens up a different kind of vibration, a different part of the brain to answer the question. By the way, if you're enjoying the podcast, just wanted to remind you that, uh, first of all, if you want to participate, um, we know that uh, the overwhelming number of our listeners listen after the, the recording is done, but some people, you know, a few people listen live. And if, if you are interested in participating or even bringing up your own issues about being stuck on step one or whatever, you know, we'd love to hear from you. So feel free to call in. The number here, 860 Two six four five four three two. That's eight six zero two six four five four three two. And we also want to remind you, if you're loving this podcast and the other, the other podcasts that we've done, we would love you to become a regular subscriber. It's free. You don't have to pay anything. It's, it'll always be free. And the best part is, when you subscribe, it means it always shows up on your smartphone or, or even on your your desktop computer. Um, Every single day that we do one, it automatically just shows up. And, and so you're reminded, oh, yeah, I've got more podcasts to listen to. Because this is definitely your best way to get your daily dose of happy. And we do it twice a day, Monday through Friday, plus once on Sunday. Um, so there's lots of opportunities to increase your attitude just by listening to us talk. Um, how do you subscribe? You do it by going to LOAToday.net. You can also do it on your iPhone by going to the iTunes store or by doing it on the podcast software. Either one, just go into the software and click the little magnifier glass and do a search on LOA Today. And if you use an Android phone, you're included too. Just go to Google Play and do the same thing. Do a search on LOA Today. So please subscribe today. And then finally, one other thing we want to remind you, if you are enjoying this, please, please share it with friends. Share it on, on Facebook or on Twitter or Instagram or, or whatever your favorite social media channel is, Reddit, I mean, whatever it is. Um, just tell them, hey, I'm listening to the LOA today. It's really good. I'm enjoying it. Or I, or I picked this point up or I never really thought about this thing that they mentioned. Because um, the more that you share it, the more other people find out about it. And not only are they benefiting, but you're benefiting too because you're reemphasizing those positive thoughts. So just wanted to get those messages in, Cindy, before we continue with this very fascinating discussion. Yeah, it's important. You know, um, good vibrations are contagious. <laughs> they are. Right. They are. I mean, have you ever noticed that if you walk into a room where there's been a conflict or someone's upset, it's very easy to, to notice the energy in the room. Um, and likewise, if you walk into a party or you walk into a room where someone seems really happy, we pick up on that too. Energy uh, entrains to itself like a tuning fork. So share, share, share away because the more people that we have in our lives that are thinking those good thoughts and focusing on what they want, uh, the better creators will all be because we have that energetic support. Absolutely. Absolutely. So getting back to what we were talking about more specifically, um, we know that people get stuck. I know if I, I have many times gotten stuck on step one. And uh, as you pointed out, uh, you, you think of it as a two-step process. I think of it as a three-step process. And I think it's really tomato versus tomato at that point. But for me, belief was always a difficult one just because um, I had built up that, that subconscious reservoir I was talking about of, no, it doesn't work, no, it doesn't work, no, it doesn't work. So any time I tried to start applying this, it was like, no, it doesn't work. And it took a long time, a long time of, of just, you know, trying it anyway, just forget what my subconscious mind is telling me, forget that feeling that it doesn't work and just try it anyway. And the interesting thing is when you try it and you do it in as positive a mindset as you can get to, and that's been my, my big thing, just getting myself as happy throughout the day as I can be, the belief starts to come. And that's one of the biggest miracles from my perspective. When you stick with being as, as happy as you can and finding all the positives in the world and 
you know, being aware of when the belief does turn into a manifest and so forth, the belief starts to come, and that, that that's reassuring to me. Yeah, I think that <clears throat> one of the things I think of a lot about this is the the idea of knowing um, and having a knowing instead of hoping for something. And we, and we say it in our language. We hear it in people's language all the time, right? It's like, well, I hope it happens. Mm-hmm. Which means I doubt and it. That's, <laughs> and that's not belief. No. That's hope, which is great when you're hopeless when you're feeling hopeless we need to have our hope restored absolutely and that's a fantastic feeling to go from hopelessness to suddenly realize it's possible that's amazing right but we don't want to stay there right. at that i hope i hope we want to move into i know i know this is going to happen and that's the belief part so while you were talking about it i was thinking about the idea that when we Get clear on what we want, I think, because we're talking about being stuck in step one, and I think one of the things that causes us to have difficulty um, in this area and being stuck there is without even knowing it sometimes, we start to focus on the how. We start to focus on how it's going to come to pass. Oh, all the time. Instead of just believing, and that's why I like so much Neville Goddard used to say to assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled. It's like just bring yourself into a state for as long as you can, even if it's just two seconds, of what is this going to feel like once this thing is a reality in my life? Not the how of it. Not the how am I going to get there because I can guarantee you it's usually going to come in a a spectacularly different way (laughs) than what you've imagined, whatever it is. How many times do you hear that story? It's like, oh, I never saw it come in this way. Oh, all the time, especially in my own experience. I mean, I think I could probably count on one hand the number of times it happened the way I thought it was going to happen. All the rest of the time, it's like, where the heck is that coming from? (laughs) I mean, a Hollywood scriptwriter couldn't write that one. (laughs) Right, exactly. And so I think that's why that's so important because it's so... We figure out how to do things all day long, right? In our in the normal course of our life and our jobs and raising kids and taking care of business, whatever it is we're doing, we're always figuring out how. Oh, absolutely. We, we're, we're wired to figure out how, and then we do it. And so, you know, it's like it's not a it's not a bad thing that our mind will go to that place of trying to figure out how. It's it's just something we're not always used to doing is just believing, it's just saying, okay. This is the thing that I want to happen, and I don't know how it's going to happen, um, but I'm going to I'm going to just believe that it's going to. That's Ma- you know that's kind of asking a lot sometimes. It is. <laughs> I mean, Mike Dooley calls it the horrible house, and I don't think he means it as, as it being truly horrible. But it's a great mnemonic, a great way of remembering it, because that way, just by having that phrase in the back of my mind, the moment I hear myself say, "Well, I wonder how this is going to happen," it cues in my mind horrible house. Like, oh. Oh, yeah, that's the wrong path. Forgot about that. Okay, reverse field. So what am I supposed to do now? <laughs> <laughs> Just keep tapping into it, right? It's that's like, right. It's very cool. And and what I see is that so many times the way the way it comes to me, the way it ends up working out is just so much easier than what I had going on in my own head. Yes. Um, so much easier. And so much better, so much more fun, so much, you know, the the synchronicity of how things happen often is just mind-blowing. And I couldn't have put it together that way. It's always better. And so those hows that we get stuck in, even though it makes sense that we would, that's the point. I love that when you hear yourself starting to think about how something, you just say no. <laughs> Well, sometimes it's a bit of a wrestling match, to be perfectly honest. But, uh, yeah, I, I, it at least gives me a way to stop and notice that I'm doing it. You know, just just having something to recognize so that uh, when I, I don't get into, like, a rampage of, well, I'm going to do it. How is this going to work? It's going to work like this. And, well, it could work like this. And then it could work. And you just drive yourself crazy doing that. Because right, right. it never works out that way anyway. It always works out some way different. So even when it comes out good, you still feel like you failed. <laughs> Well, I think part of it might be that, you know, 
if we if we want something and we don't have it, um, we automatically maybe think that it's because we haven't figured out how to have it. So there's part of our brain that wants to figure out how. Oh yeah, it's such a natural place for our thinking process to go. It just doesn't seem right to want something and not figure out how it's going to get there. Well, we've had plenty of training that tells us that we're supposed to take active steps and that uh, what, what, what are some of the cliches that we grew up with? You know, hard work leads to success. Right. You know? I keep thinking about this story um, about my I had a car that I'd had. Um, I had a car. Her name was Edna. And, yes, I named my cars. And My dad did the same thing. <laughs> and I loved this car. She was a, a Mercedes that I'd had since she was a, a baby, right? And mm-hmm. so I'd had her so she for was a years baby. and years I and years. <laughs> and then things started going wrong with her that were getting more and more expensive because she had, like, almost 200,000 miles on her. Oh and my. I just – I had so many memories with her. I'd had her forever. And so then she wouldn't start, and it was like – and I had other, I had access to the other two cars, so I wasn't ever really driving her. And I could see her from my office desk, and she was just sitting there, and I wasn't using her at all. And the fact that she wouldn't start was an issue because I was like, oh, it's like, you know, even if I sell her, then we'll have to get her towed or whatever. And I just didn't want to deal with it. But I also knew, you know, it's not the greatest um, feng shui to have a dead car just sitting there in your driveway. (laughs) And so I washed her. I kept her clean. She was pretty. But I really knew I needed to get rid of her. But I realized that I had over a decade of, like, memories attached to her. I Mm. really didn't want to sell her. So every time I thought about it, I would just make some excuse. It's like, oh, it's going to be a big hassle. We'll have to tow it, blah, blah, blah. Well, finally, I don't know what it was, but I really got into this mode of I got to get rid of her. She, I can't have a dead car in my driveway. Like other things are not happening because of this car. Mm. I have to get rid of her. And that day, we have a standing Friday lunch date, and my guy came in and and I said, uh, he said, "You ready to go to lunch?" And I was just really worked up about getting rid of this car, and I said, "Yes." I said, "But." I have to get rid of Edna. I have to sell her. I am hungry, yes, but I'm not going anywhere until I do something. We've got to put a Craigslist ad or something. We have to put a sign. And I was just like, I'm ready. I have to get rid of her. I can't wait one more minute. And he's standing there looking at me. Okay. And he said, oh, this was on your car. And he hands me a piece of paper. And I said, right now? He said, yeah, right now. I parked, and as I was coming into the house, this was on the car. It's a note, and it says, hi, my name is Melvin. If you're interested in selling the Mercedes, please call me. (laughs) It has a number. (laughs) Wow. And, And it gets even better because the car had been out there dead for like a couple of years, right? And like oh I said, goodness. I didn't need it because I have other, the other cars. And so I call him and I said, hi, I'm the owner of the Mercedes. You left a note on my car? And he said, yes, ma'am. And I said, I really do want to sell it. I said, as a matter of fact, the universe must have sent you to me because I was just now saying that I am so ready to sell this car. And he said, really? Now listen to what he said next. He said, I've been driving by, I, I drive by that road every day, and I've been having my eye on that car for two years, and I finally got enough nerve to write the note. Wow. Boy, you don't get that kind of confirmation very often. That's such great detail right there. Oh, wow. Well, so he, he, he got the nerve to write the note on the day that I finally let go of the car. Yeah, yeah. On the day that I, that I was done with the house, right, that I was like, okay, somehow... It's just going to, it'll all work out. And then you know what? The car started. (laughs) I love it. That's funny. (laughs) Yeah, the car started and um, it was very interesting. Um, I'm married to an attorney, so 
the uh, and a notary, right? So all of the paperwork. Oh sure. Literally, literally, the guy brought me the cash. We did the notary here, and he drove the car away. <laughs> I, I mean, I sold my car without ever leaving my office. <laughs> that's funny. That's really <laughs> funny, and it's a, that's a great story too. I love that. I, I do have one question though. You described her as your baby in the early years, so I have to ask: when you drove her off the new car lot, was that giving birth? <laughs> kind of, you know, it's a lot of work. <laughs> oh, yeah, my. That's I mean, a great I, story. I, I got attached to her. Um, I had her for, oh my gosh, ten years, I guess. Um, and so, it's very funny. Um, it's just the whole way it worked out was was so great, and it, it really taught me. It was one of the things that was like. Let it be easy. That's a great, great request right there. Let it be easy. Right? Just let it be easy, which yeah. is the thing I wasn't doing. And I wasn't ready. And when I did get ready, um, I just, it happened. By the way, Edna was my grandmother's name. So I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm thinking about my she grandmother. Was e, she was an E class. <laughs> and she was German, so I thought I had to give her a name that started with an E. Oh, okay. And sounded like a German name. So that was her name. And now we have E2 in the driveway. <laughs> <laughs> my my, my grandmother. We call her E2. <laughs> my grandmother may or may not have liked it when she was uh, alive, but she's been passed a number of years by, by now. And, and I feel certain she would love the fact that there was a car named after her. <laughs> <laughs> and two. We got the now that the newer one is out there, and then she too is Edna. She's taken the place of the first Edna. Oh, Edna too. Is this Edna Junior or Edna the second? Or? Yeah, Ed, E two. E two. Okay, all right. Yep, E two. <laughs> Edna two. How long have you had E two so, now? So when we get into the place of, and and here here's how imperfect this you know we the system is, so we we don't have to beat ourselves up that we're not doing it perfectly because. You know, I was pretty worked up over wanting to get rid of the car all of a sudden, and I realized that it was the right time, that energetically I had finally let go of my attachment to her, and I was totally ready. And at the same time, you know, I was still trying to figure out how. I was like, let's, we have to put an ad, and then we have to, we, in other words, we ha I knew we had to take some action. But mm -hmm. obviously just being ready to take the action put all those wheels in motion. Right, yeah. Taking the action would have so, been good. I mean, in most cases, you do need to take some, some baby steps, is what Mike Dooley likes to call them. If, in this case, you didn't even have to <laughs> climb out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I think that that's important to, to recognize, too. We were talking about asking and then believing and receiving, that one of the things that can support us in the process of believing is to take some action. Um, some kind of action, you know, I always want to make sure that we recognize that we live in a world where we take action. We live in a world that's synchronized to the mundane, right? I mean, we we have to eat, we have to sleep, we pay our bills, um, we we get up and go to work, whatever actions that we take that move us through life. And so... Yes, I think that tapping into the feeling of the wish fulfilled, how will I feel when I get that new job, I think that's fantastic. And then I also think we need to send a resume out for the job. Uh, so there's that mundane action that we take that's coupled with the, the magical action, if you will, that we take, which is bringing our energy into alignment with that thing we want. I think the there's something to be said. Coupled together, yeah, that's I, where the power is. I think there's something to be said for for doing the imagining before you send out the resume too, because absolutely when, when you do yes. it beforehand, it actually influences what you want to say on the resume. A absolutely, that pre-paving work. Yeah, um, yeah, that's so important. And so there's there's more than one thing that we and you know people always say, what can I do, right? What do I need to do? I want this thing to happen. It's not happening. What do I need to do? <laughs> That's the hows right there. There it is. Uh, and yet, and yet, there is there there is always something we can do, or most of the time. Um, and it might be a bringing our energy into alignment. It might be meditation. It might be visioning, and it might be sending out the resume. Probably it's both. Oh yeah, 
Yeah, I think it's really critical to to bring ourselves into alignment, which actually that was a phrase that really confused me for a long time because I didn't know like alignment with what? What are we talking about? What what is it what does it feel like to be in alignment? What is alignment? How how do I know whether I'm in alignment? And for the longest time I didn't know the answer to that. And then at some point I heard an Abraham Hicks workshop tape that said that you're in alignment when you're feeling good. And I said, Oh, well, I can do that. I couldn't do it right, any like other stuff. You know, get, tell, tell me <laughs> the Buddhist way and forget I'm lost. But, you know, being in alignment with just being happy, okay, I can handle that. And that way I don't have to worry about what being in alignment is. Being in alignment is no longer an issue for me. I don't even, I don't even think about being in alignment per se. I think about am I feeling good? Am I feeling happy? And then I just let, and, I let the rest of it take care of itself. Right. And the thing is, is that we, we just have to open our awareness to, tar- to start paying attention. Paying attention and to what? So that we, so that we catch ourselves. I mean, it is possible to be out of alignment or let's say unhappy, not feeling as good as we could feel. Um, so on that emotional scale, Somewhere we don't want to be on that scale, somewhere below the I feel great today, it's possible to be there for a long time before we notice it. Oh, yeah. In right? Fact, and that, so we're kind of goal, moving really. through our day with a grumble or whatever. And, and then so it's opening that awareness to catch it sooner it's and act- to do something about it. it for me, it's to actually take some it's, kind of measure. It's doing it frequently throughout the day. It isn't just doing it when I'm you know requesting that the Mercedes be sold. It's... Every single task that I'm doing, you mentioned the word mundane a few times. I think that's a good word. The mundane things that we do, every single right. mundane thing that I'm doing, I take some point of time in that mundane process, usually at the beginning, but sometimes in the middle because I forgot to do it at the beginning or sometimes even at the end. I always find some time during that process to say, how am I feeling right now? Could I feel happier? If I could then I'm going to take one or two minutes and just do one of the things I know to do to get myself into a happier space before I do the next mundane thing. Yeah, some of them are so easy, like taking a deep breath because there's a reason, because stress is a symptom of shallow breathing. Yes. So taking a deep breath will bring us out of that stress a little quicker And then paying attention to anything that's connected to our five senses, right? Yep. Just focusing on, like, what's the temperature in the room? Just noticing what the temperature in the room is, or do I smell anything in the room, or what am I seeing in the room right now where I am at or in my environment? Because all of our worries and fears, those are the things that are, they're all attached to either the past or the future. They are not generally attached to the present moment. Right. Yep. So bringing ourselves back into the present moment is an easy way to start moving back up that emotional scale. Take a deep breath and focus on your five senses. And actually, I like to focus on my best sense. I, I, I think there's something to be said for having already figured out what your best sense is so you you know it at your fingertips so to speak <laughs> um in my case it's it's auditory but whatever your best sense is when you're in that spot that you need to give yourself a little bit of boost look first to what you can do with that best sense because that's going to have the biggest impact i've found like if i oh, that's interesting yeah if i if if i need to get myself a boost and especially if i'm struggling to give myself a boost i'll always look for something to listen to Something usually, usually it's music. That's the most common thing for me. But anything that I find to be a pleasing sound, and and just focus on that for a while, and, and sort of meditate on it for a few minutes, that gives me the best boost of any of the five senses. That's interesting. I I don't know that I can say right off the top of my head um, what what my easiest sense to tap into would be. And I, it made me wonder when you were saying that. I thought, hmm, I wonder if it would automatically be like the first one that came to mind. It might um, be. It might be. Yeah. I, I know that my my sense of sound is particularly strong at all times, much stronger than any, any of my other senses. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I am extremely sensitive to music, for instance. Um, 
I could be, I like now to uh, listen to music when I'm walking. I take my daily walks when there's no snow on the ground. <laughs> and uh, during those walks, I'm listening to the positive music. And within 15 minutes of listening to it, I mean, I'm just soaring. I'm just feeling so great because I react so well to, to music, to, so well to sound. So that that's partly how I've gotten there is knowing that. Plus, my sense of sight is not really great. Um, it never has been. I've always had to wear glasses. I actually have macular degeneration in my left eye, so I'm effectively blind in my left eye. But with the glasses, my right eye is fine. I mean, I can drive and so forth. But it's never been a strong, strong sense of mine. For instance, I actually have trouble putting mental images in my mind. I have always had trouble doing that. And it was only in the last four or five years that I really learned for the first time. Most people actually are very good at putting mental images in their minds. I said, wow, really? <laughs> I thought everybody had to struggle like I did. I didn't realize that was unusual. <laughs> so it was. It became more important than ever for me to find an alternative because so much about what the gurus teach you is about visualizing, right? And, well, visualizing isn't very strong for me. Well, what is strong for me? Auditory. Okay, so how can I put auditory to work? And that's what led me to the path of realizing that auditory is my strongest sense. That's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. I have to think about that next time. I, I use this tool a lot, so and I'm <laughs> I'm going. Hmm, where do I usually go to first? I really usually decide to focus on um, the the temperature in the room. Mm -hmm. so it made me think about the sense of touch. Um, and being a musician, I my ears are pretty um, attuned as well. So whatever sense you can tap into easily, uh, go for that. You know. Yeah. Exactly. And bring yourself back into that present moment. To me, that's that's awesome. And then tap into what you think you'll feel like when that thing happens. Yes. My guess is a lot of times when we're having trouble believing, it's because we're worrying. We're we're asking for the thing. We're thinking about that thing we want, and then we immediately are thinking about how we're not going to get it or how we can't get it or how we don't know how to get it. Or <laughs> mm -hmm. And that starts to create the story that makes it difficult for us to believe. So right. it's just tapping into Im our imagination, right? Yes. Or just use your imagination. Just imagine what it would be like. Because people say to me, but if I've never had this thing, how do I know what it's going to feel like? <laughs> That's always my answer. Use your imagination. Yeah. Can you imagine what it would feel like to fly? I mean, none of us outside of a, an airplane or – you know, a hang glider or something. And we generally don't fly, but look at little kids. They'll run around with their arms out pretending to be birds. Mm -hmm. When my when my son was five, he had an assignment at school. the The page said, "When I when I grow up, I want to be." And they were supposed to draw a picture, and he drew a bird. <laughs> no kidding! Oh wow! When I grow up, I want to be a bird. <laughs> <laughs> I still think it's so funny, but yeah. So imagination. So then. Let's talk about the third step. We're talking about getting stuck at the asking point. Mm -hmm. We know now that we have to allow ourselves to imagine what it will feel like when we have it, um, keep being happy, move ourselves into a happier state so that we can believe for the thing. Um, the third step, is there anything that we have to do? No, but we usually think we do. <laughs> All we really have to do is just receive it. But there are so many things we do to block it that it, it's as if we did have something to do. Yeah. What gets in the way? Ourselves, our own misconceptions, our fears, our our negative past experiences, our concerns about the future. I mean, everything. We, we, we are masters at blocking. <laughs> we are so good at it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. You said, you know, our negative past experiences. That's one of the hardest um, things to to get over is what we call an assumption. Yes. Um, and it's because it's based on something that actually happened. And if it happened several times mm. or many times, oh, it's yeah. so easy for us to say, no, every time I do this, this happens. Um, and so... Those are, those can be difficult. Those assumptions can be difficult. Uh, and also, I just think the idea of resistance, right? You said fear. And sometimes we're afraid of, well, a lot of times 
we're afraid of change. True. Even I, the good changes. I, I, know, don't, I don't actually normally think about fear that way, although I am aware that most people are afraid of change. I actually am not – I'm probably less afraid of change than anybody else. What I'm – what I tend to be afraid of is repetition of the same result. That tends to right. scare me. Keep doing the same thing and keep having the same right. result. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, the – I think it was Virginia Sater that said – um, people generally don't really have a comfort zone. It's more like a familiar zone. Yes, um, yes. People are, it, we think of the biggest fears and we think we're afraid of falling or afraid of public speaking or afraid of the dark. But most people are just afraid of whatever's unfamiliar and they will stay in a place where they are familiar. So maybe that familiar space is the space of not making quite enough money. Um, right? It's mm-hmm. like they want, they say they want to make more money, um, but it's not familiar to them to have a lot of money. And it is familiar to them to kind of be struggling to make ends meet. So it's easier to stay there. Or they're familiar, they think they'd want a much better relationship, but they're familiar with this kind of dysfunctional relationship they've been in for a long time. So when things start to shift, a lot of times, I don't believe we sabotage ourselves. I don't like that word people say, we sabotage ourselves. I just think we keep ourselves safe. <laughs> and so That's a good way to say in, it, yeah. In some weird way, we think that because we're safe or relatively safe, like, and by that I mean we haven't died, right? So it's <laughs> like there's part of our brain that says, look, we have survived this. It might be terrible, but we've survived it. We know we can survive it. Here we go with the assumption, right, with the over with the past experience. Mm-hmm. We go, we know we've survived it in the past. Yep. So we know we can survive it again. And that other thing, that great relationship or that wealth or whatever, hey, it sounds good to me, but you know what? I've never been there before and I haven't survived it. So let's just stay here where we're <laughs> where we can survive. That's literally what part of our brain says it's the part of the brain that people refer to as the lizard brain right it's the most primitive part of our brain Mm -hmm. it it's the only brain that like a squirrel has and all he's concerned with is getting food and procreating and staying safe from the dog that's chasing him that's it there's no other thought in there and everything is on autopilot and we actually have that same part of our primitive brain and so it just wants to stay safe most of the time yeah this is true it also illustrates just how tightly and closely steps two and three are intertwined with each other because if you don't have that strong belief if you haven't completed step two before you get to step three you're dead in the water you can you can try to receive all you want to and it ain't just happening because you start off by saying, okay, I'm ready to receive, and instantly in your subconscious mind you thought to yourself, that isn't going to happen. <laughs> mm, mm-hmm. and you just you just undermined your own thing. You know, you just basically put yourself into the safe zone saying, well, here's the safe reaction. The safe reaction is it's not going to happen, so now I'm safe. Right, so I'm just going to go stand back over here in the corner. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> right? Which I did a lot wow. of, yes. <laughs> yes. Wow. <clears throat> That's good. So asking is the part we can do automatically. Yes. We're we very can good at also that. get a little more conscious about the asking process and get a little more clear on what we want. Because the more clarity we have, the, the more likely it is that we're going to get it. And the more emotion that we are attaching to it, too. It's not enough to do it abstractly we have to be engaged in it yes and you know my my story about edna being sold i really i've i've tried to dissect that story over and over (laughs) and emotion was the thing that keeps coming up Mm. is that the energy level that i had was and i don't live in that space like it was unusual even for me Mm. Um, but i was really fired up about getting rid of the car now. Um, it was a very, very strong emotion happening there. And so that energy was there. Oh, yeah. But I think that's important. That's true, is that we don't generally get that 
we can we can learn how to cultivate uh, that the emotion that's attached to the thing that we want, and then use that emotion to power the belief that we have, moving out of hopefulness and wishing for things into knowing that they're on the way. And that could be actually challenging. I mean, you, you mentioned uh, money as one of the things that people will tend to wish for and try to attract, and money is an abstraction. I mean, yes, we do have the physical pieces of paper and the credit cards and debit cards and so forth, but for the most part, it's an abstraction. So saying, I want, you know, uh, I want uh, $50,000 or something, what's $50,000? It's still an abstraction. You know, what does yeah. $50,000 feel like? <laughs> And I, I think that's why so many times um, we go into that as coaches, the money questions will, we have to dig in a little bit and and go a little further with, well, what would you have if you had that? What would yes. that do for you? Yeah, that's how you tie it. Cause yeah, because that. that's how we can we can narrow it down and tap into the feeling of it. Because like you said, there's no feeling attached to $50,000. No, not at all. Or a hundred thousand, or a million, or a billion. There's no feeling attached to it. It's very abstract. And so, when we get down to, but what would it really do for you? Maybe it's security that the person really wants. Maybe it's freedom that the person really wants. That's easier to talk about. Mm-hmm. Yep. That that starts to have emotional content. And when you find that emotional content, I'm sure as a coach, you're trying to build that emotional content up in them, or get them to build it in themselves more accurately, knowing that and that's then- what's going to make it really happen right then we then we can get into the actual belief of it and what would it feel like if you had it it's not so abstract anymore right yes and then on to the receiving that's the fun part (laughs) yeah i actually think it's all fun i mean i it it's a fun it's a fun way to experience life in that you're becoming conscious about what you're creating instead of just living at the whim of whatever happens which shows it's how much work you've done on yourself over the years to get yourself to the point where you feel comfortable with the full process and feel not only comfortable but also excited about it and thrilled about it and removing the doubt and replacing it with anticipation and so forth. You, you've, you've done a lot toward that. So it, it, it's helpful to everybody else, including me, because I'm still uh, in some ways getting there. It's helpful to know that what we're trying to reach out for really is that good. It really does feel that good once you get there. That's helpful. And then and then we're right we turn right back around and go on to the next thing. Yes. And that's that's because I think it's our nature to expand. We're never going to be finished. Yeah, you we never, never get, get it, it done. all done. You never get it done. That's that's the Abraham line, right? You never get it done. Yeah. And so it's just more fun. <laughs> Which is just fine because we're also eternal beings. So it's not like we have a deadline. <laughs> There's no deadline. There's no deadline. It just keeps going. We are in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. I can't remember what the band was, but there was a band that sang about, Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. And that's pretty much what it is. That's it. It's a never-ending story. Yep. And, you know, it's it's all good. It's all good, and it's... uh... It's exciting. It's what keeps us coming back to do this every day. (laughs) It's why I live for doing these podcasts. It just, oh, (laughs) it just picks me right up. I love it. We've got about a little over a minute left, and I want to make sure that we reinforce what we said about a half hour ago. If you haven't subscribed yet, we really want you to subscribe, not only for us, but for you. I mean, for us, because we just love to have more and more listeners. We want to spread these messages as far as we can and get as much positivity going out into the universe as we can. And we want people to be pushing it out themselves because they're excited about it. But we also want it for you because the more that you include the positive type of vibe you're getting from this podcast in your own life, the more good things are going to happen. So even, even if there are things you're struggling with, this will help you get there. So please do subscribe, LOAToday.net, uh, in your iPhone, the iTunes Store, or podcast software. Just search on LOA Today. And in Google Play, same thing, search on LOA Today. And Cindy, if they want a little private session, how do they reach you? Uh, you can find me on the web, CindyChavez.com. It's C-I-N-D-I-E-C-H-A-V-E-Z.com. Find me on Facebook, Twitter, um, everywhere. Come find me. Fantastic. <laughs> well, Cindy, help you. been a pleasure as usual. I'll talk to you tomorrow morning. And we'll see you tomorrow here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody.